G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. As the countdown for the draft continues, um, I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately. I've been uploading a lot of content. Today, we are going to be doing a Q&A video in the style of one I did prior to the trade period. So how that worked was I put up a post in the community tab of my YouTube channel inviting people to ask questions ahead of, well, first of all, the trade period, and then I did a video answering them. And today is very much the same concept. I put up a post uh, about a week ago, maybe half a week ago, inviting some questions for you guys, for me. Uh, not that I'm an expert as such, but certainly some discussion points that we can uh, talk about in this video. I'm unsure whether I'll release this as a podcast yet. I might do, depending on how long it goes for, but we got like 15, 20 questions or so to work through in this video. So thank you very much for your submissions. Let's talk about the draft. So the first question we have is from someone called Shadow Light, who says, how do you feel about the first round of the draft being on a separate night to the remaining rounds on the next night? First of all, I um, I, I think it's an annoying viewing experience. I'm, I'm kind of comfortable with it from the point of view that it gives time for clubs to sort of adjust to what's happened in front of them. So we'll, every team will have its own draft board and uh, obviously they won't know exactly what other clubs are thinking. So that time in between day one and day two is a great way for them to reset and uh, just recalibrate on exactly what they want to get out of the draft. So if a player was unexpectedly available at their first pick, that might subsequently have an impact on their later pick. So there's also the tr live trading to consider. So in between day one and day two, clubs can negotiate potential live trades and they just have a little bit more time to do it, which is why um, obviously in the past, we've seen uh, a bit of a premium placed on the first pick of day two. So I'm sure you asking the question, you probably already know all of this, but my view is that if it allows my club and every other club a little bit of extra time to potentially get their strategy straight, then I think I see the value in it. From a viewing perspective, it's kind of annoying. From a content creation perspective, it kind of makes it better because uh, it just stretches out the news cycle a little bit longer. I can make content in between day one and two, so I can't help but selfishly think about that. But I remember, I think it was 2020, was the first time I noticed it and I was actually getting into the back end of the second day of later picks. And West Coast hadn't even had a pick yet. And I was just getting bored, I just wanted it to end. Um, so there is that sort of drawback to it, but overall I'm comfortable with it being two days and I don't see it changing anytime soon. Shadow Light has a part two. We're also hearing that the AFL are looking to improve upon the spectacle of the draft to make it more inclusive to all. How would you, as in me, implement changes to do just that? That's a good question. Um, that's the first I'm hearing that they're actually trying to upgrade the, the spectacle of it. Um, I mean, I suppose it's kind of a fair assumption that they're always going to be trying to improve their the viewing experience of these uh, various things and it has come a long way. Uh, I don't even know if in like 2007 it was televised. It probably wasn't. The first draft I watched live was 2013. It has improved a lot since then. Um, nowadays, you know, I, actually in preparation for this, this video, I went and watched an NFL draft or at least like clips of it on YouTube. And to be honest, I don't think there's a huge difference in terms of presentation. I mean, it's a little bit fancier in the NFL for sure. They're all wearing suits and stuff, but there's a lot more money involved in that. You know, these players that are getting drafted in the AFL now are signing maybe contracts for like $100,000 a year, maybe a little bit more than that. Those NFL guys are getting million dollar bonuses. So you expect that to be a little bit fancier, but in terms of the actual presentation, you know, we have a lot of what they do. We have highlight clips playing as the players sort of get drafted. Um, yeah, we have analysis over the top. I don't think it really needs to improve that much. By inclusive to all, I presume you just mean appeal to a wider, more casual audience. I think broadly speaking, over the last five years observing you know, the trends on YouTube in particular, I think there's been a huge upsurge in the casual fan having an awareness and then subsequently an interest in the AFL draft. I don't think that was true when I started, farted? I don't think that was true when I started on YouTube five years ago, six years ago. I felt like draft videos were a little bit too niche back then and now they're some of my most popular content and i just feel like the average punter is getting more and more into the draft as a spectacle i mean back in the day i, I remember drafts would go by and you just sort of read about it in the paper i'm showing my age here a little bit You're like oh the eagles drafted a halfback flanker called shannon Hearn. interesting you'd find out after the draft so to answer your question like if we're looking at from the perspective of appealing to a more casual fan well, first of all, uh, to some extent, we've already had success in that area, I would say. But I don't know how you, in terms of the actual draft day experience, you'd improve that because we're already showing highlights. 
You're already getting extensive profiles. The only thing that really works against the draft is that it goes on for so damn long. And I think for once upon a time, that used to be two minutes per selection, I think for the entire draft. But then, then it was in the first round, you had five minutes and the rest two minutes. If I'm not mistaken, I think a few years ago, it became five minutes for every selection. And it just dragged on so much. So that's the only thing I would do to try and mitigate the boredom factor is maybe just shorten those, those selections down. I don't think any club needs five minutes. On the first day, they do it to drag out the suspense and, and make sure that it goes through the correct time slot. So with West Coast and Harley Reid, like we've seen in previous years, it'll the entire five minutes will lapse before they announce the pick. So personally, I'm not really calling for any kind of changes to improve the spectacle. You know, maybe the the room gets a little bit nicer. Sometimes the uh, the presentation will improve a little bit, but I don't think there's anything more we need to be doing to to appeal to a wider audience. The way to probably do that is just increase, which they've already done, pre-draft coverage. Get that fans invested in the lead up to the draft, and that will increase viewership for the actual draft. I mean, I really don't know what what would be the next step up anyway. Like live performance from Robbie Williams, <laughs> like at the draft. What's the bet that happens one day? What's the bet we get a live concert at the drafts? I don't know. I don't know. I don't follow NFL. I wonder if that's ever happened before. Interesting. But thank you for your question, Shadow Lights. Uh, Luca Rocca says or asks, is the rookie draft system a mess given it's for players that miss out on the draft, but mainly uh, AFL players delisted that are redrafted? Yeah, it is, it's an interesting new trend um, in the last number of years and, and I've done it covering the draft and the rookie draft in recent videos like retroactively looking back at previous drafts and it, it's a clear trend of r- the rookie list becoming more of an opportunity to cycle through um, not only delisted players but like your own delisted players like committing to uh, delisting and then redrafting your own rookie player. So... Yeah, this is an interesting one. I guess it's to it's almost used as a supplementary list and not not a development list, which was the original intention for it. Um, back, you know, probably five plus years ago, the the rookie list you had to be upgraded from the rookie list to play a game, and they removed that restriction a number of years ago. So, really, it's it doesn't really serve too much of a purpose anymore. They get paid a little bit less, uh, at least new rookies do. And then um, I think for people that get shifted onto the, the rookie list, then I think what happens is they are like a, a portion of their salary gets paid outside the salary cap. So it's used much more in a different way now, but also there's still so many different avenues to get players onto your list now, particularly delisted ones. There's the preseason drafts always existed and might be obsolete soon. There's delisted free agency. There's the supplemental list uh, portion as well after the drafts as well. When we know Jeremy Sharp is joining Fremantle through that. So he's deliberately not nominating for the draft. So the rookie list is becoming like this weird thing that I don't even really pay attention to anymore. Whereas before it used to produce some absolute gems and we've kind of gone away from that. Um, So I agree it is a mess. Yeah. Luca Rocco then asks, what are your thoughts on Harry Demetia and Lance Collard and could they bring something to the Eagles? So just general thoughts on both players. Yeah, I love Lance Collard. I, I think I, I can't help but be a little bit perhaps biased to him because he's from WA. I generally do pay a little bit more attention to the WA prospects. He's also a small forward and, and I believe West Coast could use a player of his type stylistically. I think he absolutely could bring something to us. I think he would be somewhat unique to the other young prospects we have. Like we just drafted a small forward in Noah Long. We just uh, traded for one in Tyler Brockman. But I think his attributes make him different again from those guys. And he's decent overhead. So he's he's kind of like a balanced forward as well. Demetia is not one that's really caught my eye, to be honest. He's, He's really fast inside mid, plays with a good tenacity. But to me, I think for a West Coast point of view anyway, we're probably not going to be needing any more genuine inside mids. Uh, like we've we've drafted, we're going to draft Reed. We're going to we've got Jinby, we've got Hewitt, um, and we've drafted Cully as well in the mid-season draft. So that part of the ground is not an area of need. And unless like maybe Demetia could be a really good pressure forward or something like that, because I, I think certainly we could use a, another young one of those. Um, but he's not one that I'm necessarily hoping gets to 29. We got three questions in a row from VCS. First one is, who is better, James Leake or Caleb Windsor? That's tough. It's a little bit apples and oranges because one's a running defender, intercepting defender, and the other one's sort of like a classy outside mid. Who is more likely to hit their potential? I think James Leake. I think James Leake. Just because I just think he is a pretty safe bet comparatively. Caleb Windsor, by comparison, is going to be uh, having to battle it out for a midfield spot, and I think it's probably just a little bit more competitive. I don't know. I might be talking out me all there. 
I think developmentally, James Leake has a little bit of a smaller gap to close to reach his potential than Caleb Windsor, if that makes sense. But not to say that he doesn't have high potential. Caleb Windsor looks like he could be a jet midfielder. It really depends. Like, what's the if I'm picking in that range? Let's say I have pick uh, nine of who who has pick nine. Uh, yeah, I think it's Essendon officially. And I was picking between Leake and Windsor. Uh, I'd probably, I'd probably just go down to list needs. But the thing is, a running intercept defender is probably a little bit more replaceable than a real good classy midfielder. So while I think Leake is the safer bet, you could probably find good running medium defenders in the second round of not only this draft but in general drafts like a lot of a lot of good halfbacks have been drafted later in drafts so as opposed to midfielders you probably would be i kind of feel like the higher you go in drafts the earlier your selection the more important the role you need to be drafting for is so key forwards uh inside mids outside mids those would probably all come before a running defender for me anyway but that's just my personal thoughts. But I don't I really think one is necessarily better than the other. Maybe if you gave him a FIFA rating, which is one way to, to look at it, you'd probably go James Leake because I think he'll probably be better from game one. VCS also asked, do you think the draft is too short being only around 45 to 55 picks this season? So the draft length is dictated purely by how deep clubs are willing to draft. It's not as though anyone set the like maximum um size of the draft which you probably already know but i'm just sort of clarifying for anyone who doesn't so it's really dictated by how much interest there is in clubs drafting late so the the fact that the draft is only 45 to 55 picks seems like a concerning symptom that there is a bit of a dip in the depth of the talent pool each year which is a concern because we are on the other side of covid now so the the players who miss football in their junior years, you know, they're, they're sort of come and gone now to some extent. I think, I mean, the guys drafted now probably miss their under-16s a year for the most part, at least the Victorian ones. So I'm not really too sure why, generally, we're not producing as much talent as we used to. It's not just this year. It feels like, you know, I think 2016, 2017, those drafts went into the late 70s. Um, and then, you know, since then, we've been seeing 50s and 60s. So with a new club on the horizon, this is a bit of a concern. I'm not too sure why that is the case. I mean, I think they shortened list spots, like total list sizes for COVID. And I'm not sure if they ever switched them back. Maybe that is a factor. But even still, like you got a club like Melbourne exiting the draft at pick 11 as it currently stands. So there seems to be a a bit of a, a lack of trust in this year's draft depth. So I don't think that is too much up for debate. It just seems like the talent pool is shrinking and it is a concern. Number three, will West Coast finish bottom of the ladder next year? He also put yes. Uh, you know what? I I would think we're the, these outright favourites, and that's fair enough. And I probably I think I had a, as a wooden spoon in my prediction. I can't help but feel though we probably won't won't win the spoon. But it's just a case of picking who would be worse than us, and that's a hard case to be making at the moment. So yeah, I'd say better, more likely than not. The history of Apple says, "What are your thoughts on Aiden O'Driscoll? Do you think Frio will take him to have the trilogy of O'Driscoll siblings?" Uh, look, Aiden O'Driscoll looks like a decent young talent. Uh, I've got a bit of pace about him. Very small wingman though, 175 centimeters. I don't know if he has enough outstanding traits outside of that for me to really want West Coast to draft him personally, even later in the draft. Maybe he'd be a good rookie selection. Do I think Fremantle will draft him? There tends to be a tendency in the AFL to pick the brother of a player that plays for them, or obviously in this case is a brother of a sister that plays for them as well. There seems to be this romantic notion. Like I can think of a few examples off the top of my head. Geelong rookie listing Zach Guthrie. Uh, Essendon drafted Jackson Merritt's younger brother in Zach in 2013. Uh, who else is there? Thomas Berry getting drafted by the Brisbane Lions when his brother Jared is there. So there is a tendency to do that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they do do that. Jacob Kov asks, do you see Hawthorne trading picks, uh, pick four for six and 11 if they're unable to draft Dersma? I think they could potentially trade down if they miss out on Dersma, which now seems like the most likely outcome. Would they trade pick four for six and 11? Yeah, you do that in a heartbeat because the difference between four and six is not that significant. And to get picks 11 as well, that's an outstanding deal. So much is it an outstanding deal that Melbourne in a million years would never do that. If they're going to trade up, potentially Dersma is one of those players that they would trade for. So they'd want pick three as a minimum. So six and 11 from a Demons perspective, that's too lopsided. It's too too far in Hawthorne's way. But that doesn't mean Hawthorne won't trade that pick 
potentially. As I said in a recent video, they put a lot of work into Nate Caddy and uh, they don't seem likely to take him at pick five. So potentially they're bracing for the possibility of trading down. Who knows? Gordo Mate asks, what are your thoughts on Zane Zakastelski? What clubs do you think need him or his type? Overall comment from what you've seen of him. Thanks, Gordo. Um, Zane Zakastelski, 196 centimeter for, uh, key defender from Claremont, who was best on ground in the Waffle Colts grand final and spent the Colts final series as a ruckman. So he's versatile, looks very athletic, can take a big grab, good intercept player, um, really good athletic capabilities. I see him as a key defender at the next level at 196 centimeters. He's too short to ruck uh, at AFL realistically. Could he be like a pinch hitter? Absolutely. We've seen shorter pinch hitters before and he's athletic enough to do so. So that, that will kind of appeal, but I think, you know, we're just looking at clubs probably in the late first to early second round, potentially mid second round who are looking for a key defender. And we know there's going to be a few. So there's Sydney, potentially as early as 15. I don't know if he really go that early. I have suggested it in my phantom draft before. We know Adelaide are on the lookout uh, for a key defender. We know that North Melbourne are likely to add a key defender as one of their five picks. Collingwood could also go tall. Um, I think West Coast would absolutely be looking at that from the point of view of just building you know, the next spine of their rebuild. Um, Brisbane Lions, if he gets that far, which I don't think he will. Even Essendon with a second rounder. I, I, think, I think this guy will appeal to a lot of clubs. Those I've listed most of the ones with the most pressing key defensive need, but where do I think he really goes? I'll be surprised if he gets the West Coast 29. I could see Collingwood, potentially Adelaide, um, and North Melbourne being interested in the 20s for sure. But I like the look of him, and I'm praying he does slide to 29 because that would be a really good outcome. If we try to future second into the top 25 to get Zach Ostelsky, I will support that. I think that's a good move. Emperor Zorg asks, this is a bit of a long-winded one, bear with me. Why don't teams bid on academy slash father-son players at the start of the draft to absorb more points worth of picks from clubs with the rights to these players? It seems like it would be an effective strategy to bid on someone like a Jordan Croft before the Bulldogs' first pick, which is going to be about pick six, in the draft to absorb that pick. So why don't clubs employ an aggressive strategy like bidding on every player that can be bid on early to maximize the draft spots consumed by matching bids? Uh, so there's a, another question here, very similar. PK3680 asks, thoughts on the Eagles using pick one on Walter to get more draft picks? I, I think what he means by get more draft picks is just to force Gold Coast to use more points because we wouldn't get more draft picks. So generally, why don't clubs bid on players that are father-sons or academies to screw over the other clubs? Uh, I think my thoughts on this are generally, first of all, there's the most obvious risk that you end up with that player. So let's say hypothetically that Hawthorne decide to bid on Jordan Croft at pick five and uh, the Western Bulldogs would need to use pick six to match. They real, run the real risk of the Western Bulldogs saying, okay, you can have him. He's not worth pick five. And Hawthorne wastes the pick five. So while, on the other hand, the Bulldogs pick after pick six, they're all in the 40s if I'm not mistaken. So that would also screw them, them, them over. They'd lose Jordan Croft, they'd have their pick six, but then they'd have a whole heap of picks in the 40s that are then useless. So it would screw over the Bulldogs, but if you're the Hawthorne list manager in this particular hypothetical, do you run the risk of being the guy who drafted Jordan Croft at pick five when he should probably go back pick 12 and you let Nick Watson, Dan Curtin, Nate Caddy, better prospects at this stage slide through? That is one possibility. The second possibility is, or the second reason rather, is that don't forget we're in an 18 club competition and it's not so much like the Premier League too much or you know other sports where you don't necessarily have to deal with clubs often and what I mean by that is there's only 17 other opponents if you are in a position to screw over a team or a club and you take that opportunity these things do swing around the other way and therefore my understanding is that clubs like to keep healthy generally speaking healthy trade negotiations so that the karma of trading will swing back the other way. If clubs just started screwing each other over left, right, and center, I think it would just become a much harder environment for list managers to get their shit done, if that makes sense. It would just descend into anarchy. Um, I know that some clubs favor good, healthy trading relations um, more than others. The, you know, I think, for instance, West Coast are pretty into trading nicely. Um, to what extent that has worked for them, I'll leave that to you. 
Uh, whereas Dodoro from Essendon is famously, you know, a bit of a hard nut to crack. So, yeah, I, I think that's basically the two reasons. First of all, you don't want to run the risk of uh, picking up a player that you don't need. And second of all, pissing off player, pissing off clubs rather that you're going to have to deal with again. And you could potentially be in a position where you don't have leverage and they can screw you over. It's, it, it does happen, or it could happen rather. Hope that answers the question. And, and why don't West Coast bid on Walter on pick one? Well, they could. They could, because I don't think there's actually a huge gulf in talent between Reed and Walter. Walter's an absolute jet. So that wouldn't be such an epic screw over as Jordan Croft at pick five. But it would probably sour in trade negotiations in the future between Gold Coast and West Coast, which you never know. You never know. It could be like, it might not even be like players requesting club uh, trades between Gold Coast and West Coast. It could be like, hey, would you be the third party in this three, um, three club trade or this live trade to help us achieve our goals? Whatever. That's, that's kind of my take on it. Rep Fitty asks, thoughts on a mock trade that sends pick one and 11 to North Melbourne, pick two and a future fourth from West Coast to Melbourne, Pick three, six, and a future second from uh, Melbourne to the Eagles. So, trying to break this down. West Coast lose pick one, but they get picks three, six, and a future second. Uh, Melbourne get pick two and a future fourth, but they lose six and 11. And North Melbourne lose two and three, but they get one and 11. Well, first of all, this is all completely hypothetical because pick one's not going to switch clubs at this stage, you don't think. Um, but it is possible. I think three, six, and a future second is very generous for West Coast. I, uh, I would take that probably. I probably would take that. Um, I don't think it's realistic. He also says uh, we could then trade six and a future third for four from the Hawks to get McKercher and Curtin. So I suppose this whole trade deal is in the interest of trying to get um, McKercher and Curtin. That's another thing as well. Six and a future third would not get us pick four. It just wouldn't. A future third is not enough. It would have to be a future second, and even then you'd be pushing it, I think. So um, for the record, I think this whole trade scenario is kind of dead in the water. And to be fair, I have waited a week before I've actually released this podcast. So that's not the, the question asker's fault. That's my fault. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that's quite even in terms of the trade suggestion anyway. Binger asked, which of Gold Coast four incoming academy players or out of them, who do you think will be a best 22 player first? I'm going to give you the basic bitch answer and say Jed Walter. I think Jed Walter is good enough and ready-made enough as a key forward to come into that Gold Coast lineup from day one and play a role. He will potentially be a bit more of a defensively-minded key forward at first, but he's physically built, uh, he's ready-made, and uh, he's got good defensive pressure. So with all that logic, I think he will play early. Ethan Reed's a long shot. Uh, well, not long shot, but a long-term build. Uh, I don't know too much about Will Graham. Um, and J- uh, Jake Rogers is is good, but he's, he's 172 centimeters and 68 kilos. So could he come in as a pressure forward potentially? But I think with Gold Coast list starting to mature, it's going to be hard to crack in. So I think Jed Walter plays early and becomes best 22 early. P. Toll Savage asks, prediction for biggest draft bust and b- biggest steal. Um Okay, interesting. I'll I'll answer the bust part first because the next question is similar. So, the biggest draft bust. That's tough. I think... I don't don't feel comfortable, like, really picking a player to be a bust. I'd say if I had to pick players that are really favoured to do well, like, and I can find a reason why they wouldn't, maybe Nick Watson being 170 centimetres and as lightly built as he is could work against him. And maybe that same talent doesn't translate at AFL level. I'm not saying I don't think he will. I think he'll be just fine. But that's one like example of a firm argument I could make. There's some substance to that. Because, yeah, Cozzy Pickett's about the same height. Cozzy Pickett's also about three times wider. He's just a thick boy. Um, Nick Watson will do most of his damage in space, but it'd be interesting to see how he handles the contested side of the game. We see Caleb Daniel play a pretty uncontested style as a running defender. And I still think Nick Watson could probably end up as a small defender at AFL level. We'll see how he goes. But um, yeah, I wouldn't bet on him being a bust. It's just more, you know, trying to answer the question. Demetia as well is probably one that I think, I'm not sure I see the appeal 
that early in the draft. I, I think he's got elite speed and he's a busy sort of player. I feel like his kicking can be inconsistent and uh, seems like a honest trier. To me, he seems like someone I probably wouldn't draft too early based on the fact that I'm not sure if I see it as a midfielder. Um, whether that makes him a bust or not, probably not. Uh, George Stevens. I actually haven't seen too much of this guy. But one thing I'll say is surely it's not conducive to playing good football as a midfielder if you're 101 kilos and less than six foot three. Like, that is crazy. I, I need to see how this guy tests. But to me, that is just not the dimensions of an AFL footballer. He's too big. He's too big. Too heavy. Too heavy. On the topic of steals, uh, we have the next question from Mitch Fs, who says, which draftees that may not be in the top 10 have a bit highest potential, the highest ceiling? So that kind of ties in as, a, as another qu- uh, part of the biggest steal question. I'll, I'll throw in some guys with high ceilings. So we talked about Zach Ostelski, I think, with his athletic profile and his ability to play in big games. I, I think there is a, there's a large amount of upside there for a guy that's nowhere near the top 10. Ashton Moore, I suppose, to an extent, uh, the forward from South Australia who was considered a top two talent at the start of the year and is now probably second or third round at, the, at this current rate. Um, but prodigious talent, goal scorer, uh, consistent mark and goal player. Didn't have the year he wanted this year. But with his talent, there, you'd have to say there's a high ceiling there. Cooper Simpson is one that as well that I think has really dynamic traits for a midfielder. I really like the look of him and wouldn't mind him at West Coast at all. Joel Frazier as well. Sometimes looks a little bit cumbersome, but kind of the ideal frame and size and general profile of the modern day wingman. He's about six foot three, strong overhead, kicks goals, just needs to find a little bit more of the ball. But I think there's genuine upside there and probably goes late. And then the Ruckman and Mitch Edwards, I think people are sleeping on a little bit. He was considered top 15 probably at the start of the year, maybe even mid-year, and he's fallen away to be considered potentially sliding out of the top 40. So Mitch Edwards, I think, is worth taking a punt in the 20s, let alone the 30s. And therefore, I think he has probably one of the bigger, higher ceilings out of those later prospects. So those are just a few nominations. We have the next question from he he he. Uh, this one might be a little bit dated. Again, I've, I've kind of answered this question a little bit late. Uh, but he says, who do North take with two and three? I think the most likely outcome right now is McKercher and Dersma. Just a few more questions to rattle off this podcast, guys. Bally0207 says, late round Smokies for Eagles and Cat B players. So first of all, I'll talk about the two Cat B potential players for West Coast. And what I mean by Cat B is next generation Academy talents who, if they don't get drafted in the national draft or bid on at all, the West Coast can sign them as a Cat B player, I believe, or, or at least sign them to the rookie list. So uh, that's how I'm going to answer this question. Uh, so there's two that have caught my eye, assuming Lance Collard is not going to be available because he will get drafted. Cohen Livingston from the Perth Demons Football Club, if I'm not mistaken, is a tall 199 centimeter key forward prospect that can ruck as well. I think he fills a list need. Seems a likely type. Kind of, I think he started the year well and then sort of fell away this year, and that's... Well, uh, I wish he'd had a good year, obviously, but I mean, if it works out in us being able to cat B list him, I'm happy with that. And I bet on that happening. And then also the small defender, Oscar Hein Bastion as well, uh, has caught my eye as a, as a crafty small defender, which would add something different to our list as well. So those are the two guys I'm hoping we sign as cat B rookies. In terms of other late prospects, um, one guy that I do like the look of is Reese Torrent from Peel Thunder. He's like a smooth moving midfielder. Um, yeah, from Peel Thunder, if I can't remember if I said that. Very classy, very much a Eagles type player from maybe five years ago, like a very poised and skillful player who can accumulate. We haven't really drafted like that in recent years, but that's probably just to be like kicking off our rebuild. But he does seem like a little bit of a safe type, doesn't really take risks with the ball from what I can see, but is tidy. And I can see him appealing to us and I wouldn't mind him either as a rookie or with one of our last picks. The other one is Joel Frazier, who I just talked about as a being a big bodied wingman. Again, I think there's uh, some upside there. Is he a late draft smoky? Maybe not, maybe he goes in the late twenties. It's, it's a little bit hard to read with Frazier, uh, but if he's still there at maybe our fourth pick, that's where I'd be happy to take him. Wertie asks, this isn't related to the draft, but what are your thoughts on the idea of opening the season with round zero in the Northern, Northern States? So yeah, since this question has been asked, um, and I'm, this is the time I'm answering it, this is now called opening round, and it has been announced for prior to round one. Feels like a silly little gimmick. I think the understanding is, well, my understanding is, 
the NRL is like playing a game in America at that point, and so they're going to deliberately play big games in the Queensland states to get some more interest. I can only assume that this decision is based on some sort of data which will suggest that when there is no NRL on, people go to AFL games. That is the only logic for it, uh, because they're obviously trying to break into that rugby state market. I couldn't really care less. I think it's a little bit weird, but I'm sure I'll be grateful to see football regardless. Um, So I'm pretty indifferent to it. But it will be interesting, I guess, to see Queensland and New South Wales hosting like big primetime games. I think it's Sydney, Melbourne, GWS, Collingwood, Gold Coast, Richmond, and Brisbane versus Carlton. Um, So two prelim rematches there. Yeah, can't complain. Footy's footy. I'm, I'm happy. I'll eat it up. And the final question from Chris, who asks, where can I find draft-related content for WA Draft Prospects on Instagram? Well done, Chris. Well played. I'll give a shout-out. At WA Footy Prospects on Instagram has done a great job for a few years now on uh, giving you some information about West Australian Draft Prospects. So shout-out to them. They do great stuff. Go give them a follow. Anyway, guys, that wraps up this podcast. Um, Thank you very much for your submissions and your questions. Um, Again, maybe we can do one after the draft. We'll see. I'm kind of tinkering with the idea of continuing making content through the summer um, because at this point I'm unemployed. So yeah, that would help. But um, yeah, we'll see. I turn 30 soon. I'm thinking of doing a birthday podcast, maybe a Christmas podcast, maybe a New Year's podcast. Why not? Sounds like fun, right? So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your support lately, guys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.